Hello hackers! I'm Jan, welcome to Pwn College, and in this video we are going to be talking about data. This video is part of our assembly crash course. If you're just seeing this video out of context, go back and start at the beginning of the assembly crash course. All right, let's talk about some data. Uh, recall that all roads lead to the CPU. Recall that the CPU only understands binary code, ones and zeros. So let's dig in. What is binary? Ones and zeros. Uh, binary is a the, the number system of base two. Um, originally, mathematically, and this is uh, in the kind of, um, you know, the, the Western world described by Thomas Harriet uh, and, 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 and possibly by these other people roughly at a similar time between the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, it was known earlier by other civilizations much earlier as most of these sort of things are. Um, but now we're using it to power our YouTube videos, which is fun. All right. So a binary digit is called a bit. You probably know all this, by the way. I uh, just want to make sure that we have a solid footing for everybody so that we can move forward and learn the crap out of assembly. All right. Um, and, you know, as you count up, you know, with, with, with base 10, you go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then the number after 9 requires two digits, 1, 0, number 10. In binary, you go 0, 1, and then right away, you have 1, 0, because there is no 2. Right? So you can see on the right here the um, uh, decimal values and their associated binary representation. And uh, I have a typo here. Uh, instead of 24, I have 14 by accident. There's only one 14 in decimal. The number after 23 is 24, obviously. But you can kind of see um, that, that, that you know, binary represents things same way as decimal does. By the way, a fun trick, if you count on your fingers and you do it in base 10, you can count to 10. If you do it in base two, you can count to two to the 10th because you have 10 bits that you can set at will. And so you can see with just five fingers or just four fingers even, let's say I could count to 15 by holding up different fingers. But at some point you'll accidentally flip someone off. Okay, let's uh, dive onwards. So that's binary in the mathematical sense. Uh, of course, computers speak binary. Why do they speak binary? Well, because of, of logic gates, because it's easy to build a logic gate that we talked about back in the first lecture in this module. It's easy to build a logic gate with ones and zeros because that makes logic easy. Now, there are other logical systems that can do uh, base three, for example, ternary logic. And ternary computers exist, but mostly in like toy and historical form. Uh, generally speaking, ones and zeros are the way to go. They're just easier, they're easier to conceptualize, and they are easier to um, um, build, right? Boom, done. All right, if you had like a system, like a base 10 system, and, and imagine that, that you were using light to send data, instead of just saying, is there light or isn't there light? Now you have to reason about, okay, is the light like half on? Is it like eight? Is it one? I mean, but this one zero, super easy. All right, light, electricity, everything lends itself pretty well to that. So we use binary code. Now, why, how do we as humans interface with binary code. Well, it just has a lot of digits, making it very difficult to, to deal with. If I told you 10101011, you're just going to be like, Jan, why are you just, what happened, right? What, what is happening to you? But with a computer, of course, a lot of data is okay, but we still need to be able to reason about the data that the computer is processing, especially on the level that we're going to be reasoning about it in this course. So how do we represent um, binary data? Well, we could represent it as decimal, right? We could say, hey, uh, you know, 1010, oh, oh, that's 10. That's great. Or, or you say, okay, hey, let me move myself. Oh my God, every time. Let me move myself here where I'm not in the way. 
could say, okay, hey, we got a number uh, one one o o o o o o. Oh, I think I had an extra, and that's you know one twenty. You can memorize all this, but it's going to be difficult to deal with. Okay, so decimal is is not great, uh, and 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 another way of of saying this is like a lot of like the round numbers don't line up. I mean, you see, this is this seems like a very round number, right? Um, or this seems like a very round number, but it's just 240. I mean, yeah, if you work with computers long enough, you start recognizing these common numbers, but once you kind of uh, scale up to bigger and bigger numbers, it, it becomes difficult. So uh, someone realized somewhere along the, the way that, hey, if you use a base that is a power of two, base four, eight, uh, 16, et cetera, et cetera, then we can actually represent multiple binary digits in one of these uh, digits cleanly. My right? base 10 represents like uh, three point something digits per base 10 digit. That's uh, really weird. Whereas base eight represents exactly three digits. Base 16 represents exactly four digits. And so we use octal base eight or hexadecimal base 16 to represent binary code instead of base 10. And here it is on the right. And so you can see with this 11110000, hey, that's F0. Of course, hexadecimal has 16 digits. We only have nine digits or 10 digits, sorry, available in base 10. And that's the digits we know and love. And so we padded them with, num with letters. So hexadecimal, the value, the number after nine is A, then B, then C, then D, then E, then F. F translates to uh, fifth, uh, 15 in, in decimal. And then after that, it's hex one zero, right? And we can already see in hex one zero, it lines up beautifully. You know, a bunch of zeros here, boom, a bunch of zeros there. Now all of these big round numbers line up well, a little better even than, than, um, octal. Um, and, uh, you know, there, the, there are places where you use octal base eight, but, but hexadecimal, is king. That's how we display data. The CPU sees it as uh, binary code or binary uh, numbers. We see it as hexadecimal numbers, typically. Awesome. Let's move on. And uh, now we all know hexadecimal. So that's numbers. What about text? At some point, you know, uh, you, you're looking at this slide and it's it shows you text. It's not showing you a bunch of hexadecimal, right? Um, well, the way that we express text is in a different encoding. Basically, uh, the text encoding that we use is ASCII, uh, an, an expansion of ASCII actually called UTF-8. That's the text encoding that powers most of the web. Um, and uh, the precursor to UTF-8, which is called the American Standard Code for Information Exchange, was created in uh, like the... Um, um, the, the, the 60s, the late 60s or something. Um, and uh, it specifies how to encode using seven bits, um, and the, basically the letters that are on your keyboard, if you have an English keyboard. Um, but basically lower case, uppercase, uh, English letters, Latin letters, but you know, uh, specifically uh, in this case, English letters, uh, the digits, and then a bunch of common special characters. This on the right is an ASCII table every freaking time. Moving me. On the right here is an ASCII table. And uh, the way that you look it up is uh, the left side is the first hex digit. The, no, my bad. The, uh, the top is the first uh, hex digit um, from two through seven. The left side is the second hex digit. So hex 41 encodes in ASCII to the letter A. And so whenever you see like this A right here, the uh, capital letter A, somewhere over the crazy storm of bits that flew over your, uh, into your wireless card to give you this slide, there was a hex 41 representing that letter A. All right. For the most part, um, you can kind of see these these shortcuts. Hex 40 plus the number of the letter, A is the first letter, B is the second letter, and so forth, is uppercase letters. 
hex 60 plus the letter. So hex 61 is A, hex 65 is E, etc. Um, digit representations is hex 30 plus the digit. Hex 35 is uh, the representation of the digit 5, like this, right? and so on. Um, there are some other special characters that you will learn to recognize. You will learn that 2F is forward slash, probably. Um, all right, I mentioned ASCII started out uh, very uh, kind of, you know, uh, America focused. It's actually called American Standard of, of uh, uh, Information Exchange. Uh, it evolved when the web became global and we needed common ways to express uh, uh, any language. It evolved into UTF-8, the, I think, universal text format. Uh, don't quote me on that one. Um, so UTF-8 basically is ASCII, but if the top bit is set, it's an 8-bit uh, format initially. If the top bit is set, it reads more bits. And if those top bits are set, it reads more and more bits. Right? And so it has, uh, it can represent a lot of things, uh, a lot of different uh, uh, language uh, glyphs, and also a lot of emojis. That's where all your emoji come, emojis come from. Um, UTF-8 is very important. It came from ASCII. Tell your friends. All right, but in this uh, class, mostly when we look at um, the types of programs we were looking at, and even when you look at programs that deal with English text, ASCII is still your go-to, typically. Um, of course, there are other ways to format text uh, that we'll talk about right now, actually. All right, so bits, eight bits in code, actually technically seven bits, but eight bits with UTF-8, encode a single letter. Now, 8 bits is what we call a byte nowadays. Historically, this is tied to text encoding. The reason that we have 8 bits to a byte, a byte just being a collection of bits, 8 of them to be precise, is because of text. Um, basically, you can have any bit number of bits to the byte. I've worked with architecture with insane amounts of bits, a lot of bits to a byte, little bits to a byte, etc., etc., etc. These were all ancient. From the like the late '60s was the most recent one, and there's a reason for that. In the '60s, while also being involved in the creation of ASCII, for some reason IBM created another EBCDIC, another format for expressing text. There was some wonky other thing. Right? I mean, basically the same letters in different configurations. So hex 41 wouldn't be capital A; it would be some random junk. I, I actually, for some reason, was looking at EBC DIC last weekend, so I could kind of picture the table in my head, but not enough to tell you what hex 41 is. I think the letters were on the bottom left. Anyways, um, EBC DIC was an 8-bit text encoding, and IBM's mainframes were very widespread by 1963, and so they kind of created the 8-bit byte by accident. ASCII replaced EBCDIC, but you know the concept of 8 bits to a byte stuck. Every modern architecture uses 8-bit bytes. Uh, technically speaking, a byte is not, I think, officially defined as 8 bits. That's like an octet if you want to be extremely precise. But whenever anyone says bytes, they mean 8 bits, except for in very esoteric situations. So, bits form into eight bytes, each of which can uh, hold uh, some values or, you know, encode some text if you look at it as text. Okay, now how do we uh, group bytes into words? And again, oh my God, and again, I'm doing the wrong thing. And again, I am covering slide text. I'm sorry about that. Um, all right. Uh, bytes get grouped into words. So when I tell you x86 is a 64-bit architecture, what I actually mean is that x86 deals with bits, 8 bits to a byte, 8 bytes to a word for a word length of 64 bits, and it deals with 64 bits at a time. All right. Um, now this has some historic oddities because we didn't always have 64-bit architectures. So once upon a time, we just had 8-bit architectures. And so a byte was just a byte. 
Then we had 16 bit architectures, but a byte was still 8 bits. And so then we said, okay, well, we need uh, some other you know, name to call it. That was a word. Then we created a 32 bit architecture. So then we said, okay, well, uh, but 16 bits is a word. So 32 bits is going to be a double word. But then other people said, okay, the word width is, th or sorry, 32 bits. So 32 bit is going to be a double word. Other people said, hey, 32 bit is the word length of the archi architecture, the word width of the architecture. So 16 bits is now going to be a half word. So you have this overlap. So like half word could be, or word could be, uh, both refer to 16 bits. Double word or word could both refer to 32 bits. And then when we went to 64 bits, uh, people said, okay, you know what? This is insane. Let's just call it a quad word. So it is. So nowadays, the safe way to say things is half word is uh, two bytes. Double word, which you would think is four times the half word, but no. Half word is two bytes, double word is four bytes, quad word is eight bytes. At least that last step makes sense. Awesome. Okay, so, you know, if you want to talk about words, uh, my recommendation, be precise. Also, fun fact, half of a byte is called a nibble. Um, I just put that in there just for fun. Okay, cool. We talked about expressing text. Um, let's talk about uh, expressing numbers, right? A 64-bit architecture, 64-bit CPU, can reason about 64 bits at a time, generally. That's what it means. It means it's, it's word width, the amount that typically fits into its registers, et cetera, et cetera, is 64 bits. Now, there are um, other kind of clever ways to reason about more. So actually, modern x86 is really cool and it actually has specialized hardware to reason about 512 bits at a time. That's 64 bytes. That's a lot of data. Uh, it uses that for stuff like um, you know multimedia processing and so forth. All right. So um, 64 binary digits can express an enormous range of values from zero at the minimum to some other cool numbers. Hex 539 is 1337, that is a very elite number. Uh, to the maximum, which is two to the two, uh, sorry, two to the 64 power minus one. So every bit is an additional power, uh, 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 an additional amount of data that you can uh, convey. If you have one bit, you can just say one or zero. You can only convey two values. If you have two bits, you can convey four values. A one, a zero, a zero, a one, a one zero, and a one one, right? Um, and every additional bit doubles it. So an n bit number can convey, can, can encode, can represent two to the n total values. And the maximum value is two to the n minus one. So from zero to two to the n minus one. The maximum 64-bit integer is this monstrosity. And in hex, we are presented as FFFF, 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 FFFF. Cool. All right. Quick sidebar that will kind of start getting our, our, our uh, thinking juices flowing. What happens if you add 1 to the maximum 64-bit number? Well, you would normally end up with a 65-bit number, right? If you add 1 to the maximum 1-bit number, the maximum 1-bit number is 1, you get 1, 0. That's a 2-bit number. But the 65th bit doesn't fit in a 64-bit um, architecture. So where does it go? Actually, don't panic. We don't lose it. The CPU has a special place where it stores it. That special place is actually shared. Any operation that will end up making a 65th bit, that 65th bit will, will get put into this special box. So if you want to, if you want it, you need to get it right away after that, after the, the what we call overflow, where you overflow um, uh, integer overflow, where you do an integer operation, you add one to a very large number, and you end up with z with 65 bits. You overflowed the maximum value. Um, so, and of course, the inverse happens when you subtract one. You have zero, and you subtract one, and then you underflow, um, and and it it gets saved the same way. We save that that extra one, and and uh, uh, conceptually similar, and go from there. All right. I'll talk about that a uh, couple uh, of, of lectures from now, actually. 
So we just said subtracting one from zero. Now that gives us negative one, but all of the numbers we're looking at here, they're, 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 they're very, very positive numbers. So how do we talk about negative numbers? Um, well, John von Neumann uh, of uh, von Neumann architecture fame, which you heard about a couple lectures ago, um, actually gave a suggestion to use something called two's complement. It's a crazy idea and it replaces an older idea that said, hey, why don't we just have a bit, the, 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 the leftmost bit here, right here, it'll say that, hey, this number is negative. So this number will be positive, 0011 1 is positive three, but one in an eight bit architecture, but you can imagine 64 bit is just one and then way more zeros. And then one one, that'll be a negative three. That's nice and simple, but it has a drawback. We have two different representations for zero. We have positive zero and negative zero. Mathematically, this is a bad news. You know, we, we, we don't want to have to deal with two representations of zero in terms of implementing mathematical operations. Um, the other thing is that uh, any operation you make, like add, subtract, etc., etc., it has to be aware of whether it is dealing with signed numbers or unsigned numbers. Because if you have a zero and you subtract one from it and you end up with negative one, you're going to end up with this situation, one, a bunch of zeros, negative one. And then if you're only talking about positive numbers, so you just want as many positive numbers to represent as possible, which means the biggest one is 255, then zero minus one should be 255. So your CPUs would have to be sinus aware. You'd have to have multiple instructions, one for doing add, un, add sign, add unsigned, or different sets of, of, of uh, uh, places to store sign and it would be a nightmare. So uh, von Neumann, came up with a, uh, or maybe uh, found elsewhere and, and, and proposed to use it, a uh, very clever approach called two's complement. First of all, two's complement has one representation of zero, it's zero. That's nice and easy. All zero bits, zero. And the crazy thing is that negative numbers have the same representation as positive numbers. So zero minus one is all ones and that is both 255 and negative one. If you subtract another one from that, it's all ones and one zero, it's 254 or negative two. And so you can do your arithmetic for the most part without worrying about the sign. Definitely add, subtract um, several others. You don't have to worry about the signness of the data. Um, it's the same. Um, another benefit, the leftmost bit here is still the sign bit because you all negative numbers will have that as one which is great now the downside is you'll go a little crazy because I mean why does this represent negative one you can kind of see it why does this represent negative two you can still kind of maybe see it but if you look at an arbitrary uh, bunch of ones and zeros it's very hard to say what negative number it is um, uh, but basically, if you take this value as a positive number and you subtract 256 from it, that's going to be the negative. All right. It kind of makes sense from that perspective. Um, all right. Um, now, in two's complement, the smallest expressible negative number in 8-bit, uh, 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 for an 8-bit byte, is negative 128. It's 1 followed by all zeros. This is on in unsigned land 128 and then it's 256 or sorry if you subtract 128 uh, this if you were looking at it as an unsigned as an unsigned integer would be 128 uh, wait is this right yes 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 uh, if you were looking at it as an unsigned integer it would be 128 if you subtract 256 from that, you end up with negative 128. That's its value in two's complement when you're thinking about it in the context of it being signed. Um, if you subtract one from that, negative 128, you end up with a zero in all ones. That's a positive number now. 
127, the biggest positive number in the signed interpretation of two's complement. Again, the data can both be interpreted as, as a signed integer, in which case it ranges from negative 128 to 127, or an unsigned integer, in which case it ranges from zero to 255. Super cool stuff, and this is actually where the, if you've written in C and you've done, it said unsigned int versus int, which by default is signed, that's where that's what it, uh, it changes, is the types, not the types of operations performed on the data typically, because they are agnostic to signness, but, but actually, as we'll learn later, how that data is reasoned about to make decisions, which is super cool. Anyways, two's convolute, really cool. Let's move on. All right, finally, let's talk about the anatomy of a word. So we have a, this is a 32-bit word. We have a bunch of uh, bits. Here it is represented in hex. Um, this says cool cats. Uh, very, very clever by me. All right, anyways, um, so um, there's a number of names for a number of, uh, of things. One, things to the left, I mirrored on the screen, but anyways, things to the left are the most significant or the leftmost or the high bits. Now, why are they most significant? Because a change in those bits will most change the value of that number. Right. Uh, conceptually, you can think about it in, in, in decimal. If I have the number 7 million and I change the leftmost digit to 6 million, that's a huge difference. If I change the rightmost difference and get 7 million and 1, that's a small difference. That, hence, the rightmost bit, the low bits are the least significant bits. And, you know, you have the same least significant byte, most significant byte. The last bit is, is that, that, that most least significant bit. The last byte is the byte holding it. Um, same that the first bit, which is also the sign bit, um, and the first byte. All right, now you know the parts of a, of a word. Actually, you know an enormous amount now about data as it exists inside computers. Hopefully, you're ready to learn about how computers process this data. See you soon.